We want to welcome in our guest lecturer today, Michael Rosenblum. Michael is the owner of the VJ.com. And of particular interest to us is Michael's experience in the media industry and the fact that Michael has taught more than 50,000 video journalists how to tell stories over the course of his teaching and consulting career. So we're very lucky to have someone with his expertise share with us today as you guys are in the middle of your journey of learning how to tell video stories during our uh, internship together. So Michael, uh, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Welcome and take it away, sir. Hey, Gene, thanks for the invitation. I'm happy to be with you. If you could all turn on your video, it makes it much more normal for me than just looking at names on a screen. That's a much better experience. I think the, the best thing I can do is give you a bit of my background and how I got into the business and what I do. And then Gene has forwarded me many of your questions, so probably I should reserve as much time as I can to answer those. That would be much more worthwhile. I also sent Gene two videos that uh, we may or may not end up showing if they help to answer the questions. So just by way of background, um, my, la my first job in the business, probably like yours will be, is I was some dumb intern at WCBS Channel 2 in New York, the local CBS News Channel. And uh, I worked my way up to being, I don't know, researcher or something. And then I got a job with uh, WNET 13, which is the PBS station here. And of course they pay next to nothing. They paid me $300 a week. And I started as a production assistant, slicing bagels and making coffee. But slowly I crawled my way up because one of the grants of public television, they leave you alone, which was great. So they pretty much left me alone. I was on some unwatchable program that was on at six o'clock in the morning on Saturdays. Not even my mother would tune in. But because they left me alone, I started to make these little news stories, mini documentaries where you'd have two New Jersey politicians in swivel chairs. And uh, in five years, I won 11 local Emmys, which was pretty good for starting from nowhere. So I got hired by CBS Sunday Morning, which is actually still on the air. If you ever watch that, you're probably out of the, oh, you do watch it. That's good. You're kind of out of the demographic. But um, the show looks exactly the same way it did when I went to work there 30, God knows how many years ago. In fact, some of the people are still on the same staff. Anyway, um, I was there for two years and suddenly I went from making $300 a week to making $100,000 a year in my late 20s in the 1980s, which was a pretty good number. And everybody thought I had a great job and a great career and I quit. I quit after two years because I thought it was all crap. I didn't like it. We went out with the cameraman, the sound man, the producer, the director. Everybody had their finger in the pie, couldn't do anything you wanted to do. And, and then also what was really bad was all the correspondents who were making a million dollars a year got all the credit and I was doing all the work. I flew out, I wrote the script, I did the interviews, I did everything. And then I, the last thing was at an Emmy Award and one of these guys, a very famous person, stood up and said, I, getting his Emmy, my Emmy, he said, I wanna thank all the people who helped on this. And I thought, you know what, I don't need this. So I quit and all my relatives thought I was out of my mind. So you go home to your family and say, guess what? I just quit a big job, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And I bought a home video camera. In those days, they shot television with beta cams. They cost about $70,000 and they were the size of a refrigerator. I put them on the thing. And I couldn't afford one. So I just bought a home, essentially a high eight home video camera. And I went to live in a Palestinian refuge camp in the Gaza Strip. And I moved in with a family for a month. And I just shot video by myself. I didn't know what I was doing. Everybody thought I was crazy. And I came back to the United States with my pilot tapes, because we shot tapes in those days. And I went to see a guy named Les Crystal, who sadly just died last week. And he was the executive producer of the PBS News Hour, which was then called the McNeil Lira News Hour. And I showed him my little stories that I'd made, and he bought two of them for me for fifty thousand dollars, which I thought that was pretty good for one month's work. Yeah, no kidding. And it wasn't all that hard to do. But for him, it was a bargain because he didn't have to send the camera and the sound and the producers, the hotels, the meals, the airfare, all that stuff went away. So he said, "What else can you do?" So I went off to Cambodia and I hung out with the Khmer Rouge for a month, and I did stories there. And then a guy named Ted Koppel, who you probably never heard of, found me, and he started commissioning pieces for me. And I probably would have kept doing that, except a Swedish billionaire named Jan Stenbeck. If you ever read The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, he's the only real person in the book. That's what Stieg Larsson, who wrote the book, worked for him. So he understood the economics of what I had done, because I'd gotten rid of the cameraman, the sound man, the producer. I got rid of everybody. And it was cheap TV, and he was building the first commercial television network in Scandinavia. So he flew me to Sweden, and he asked me this seminal, life-changing question. He said, can you teach other people to do this? And I said, any idiot can do this. Intelligent people have a hard time with it, but any idiot can do it. So he, he capitalized the company with me, put up a million dollars, gave me 30% equity. And I started building television stations across Scandinavia, local TV stations, then three national networks, TV3 Norway, TV3 Sweden, TV3 Denmark, all based on this model. Essentially, we hired 30 people like you, I guess young people, relatively, 
And essentially, I taught them. I put them through this boot camp that I invented because I had to be on the air in 30 days. And I taught them to shoot and cut and edit and tell stories in a different way by themselves. And then we ran the TV stations like a newspaper. We had, you know, we said, here's the camera, there's the door, don't come back without a story. And they turned out to be very, very cost effective. And people actually wanted to watch them, which is the most impressive part. And so then I got a call from a guy named Paul Sagan. They were starting a new 24 hour channel in New York called New York One. And he flew me out to New York and he said, can we do with you what you did in Sweden? I said, sure. And much to his credit, he did. So I built New York One, which is still on the air to this day. Then I did Germany, Belgium, Sweden. I spent five years at the BBC flipping 15 local TV stations there. We put 1,400 people through the boot camp. I think this way, I did WKRN and I didn't do many in America. I did three or four stations in America. Because we can talk about why American local TV stations are reluctant, Gene, we can discuss this, why TV stations are reluctant to embrace this extremely good system. But um, then I, I, ah, I, I, sold, I sold another company to the New York Times and I became the president of New York Times Television. I took the Times into video. I launched a production company, New York Times TV. We, we became the biggest nonfiction television production company in the United States in two years using this method, only BJs, or you call them MMJs. I produced about 8,000 hours of really appalling reality TV shows like Trauma, Life in the ER, Paramedics, Dirty Wars, Labor and Delivery. Pretty much all of TLCs and travel channels line up. Then I, I got bored, so I opened a video bar and cafe in the East Village across from CBGB, which you also never heard of. But it was a punk rock, it was a punk rock you never heard of. I'm so old now, it's just pathetic. And uh, one day Al Gore walked in, who you may have never heard of, and he had just lost the election for vice president, and he said, I want to start, and I don't know if it's a southern accent, he said, I want to start a new TV channel. It's going to be history of politics. I said, no, Al, the whole revolution gone, people are making their own stuff. So we launched a channel called Current TV, which was the first used before YouTube, the first user-generated cable channel. We sold that a couple of years ago to Al Jazeera for about $500 million, which is not a bad, not a bad turn of the dime. And uh, I was about ready to retire. We got this nice house in England. I made a pile of money. I didn't care anymore. And then I got a call from Spectrum, who had bought Time Warner's cable systems. And they said, we want to start a 24-hour channel in Los Angeles. They had bought New York one, so it's not called Spectrum one. And they said, we want to start a 24-hour channel in Los Angeles, like LA one, and we want you to come and work on it. Since you did the first one in New York, it was so successful. So I said to my wife, one more time, and we're getting out of here. So we went out to LA, and... Uh, much to the, when I got to LA, they had hired a bunch of, you know, MMJs, as they call them. And they bought all these giant XD, Sony XD cams with big sacro tripods and radio mics and lights and all this crap. And I went, I said, send everything back. And they said, what do you mean? I said, we're only going to use iPhones, nothing else. All your reporters are going to carry iPhones, that's it. And much to their credit, because most people wouldn't have the courage to do it, they went, okay. So we went all iPhone, which was the first really major cable operation to go all iPhone, 24 hour cable channel. And then I said, we're not going to make conventional news stories because they're just generally unwatchable. You know, stand up, or man on the street, the B-roll, the narrative. Blah, blah, blah. So instead, I looked at Hollywood movies because everybody who watches cable, and everybody on cable, everybody who watches television, cable, I mean, I think, basically, you spend most of your time watching Netflix and stuff like that. That's probably what you all do anyway. You're all watching Netflix and HBO. And so when people come to the news, there's an inherent expectation that their news should look like Netflix, which it doesn't. It looks like WCBS Channel 2, 1982, which is bad. Why the ratings are so bad. So I said, we're not going to do any more news stories. From now on, we're going to make little movies about news stories. It's reality TV. We're going to find people. We're going to make characters. We're going to make art and story. Because it's just the reporter with their phone, we're going to inject them into the story. They'll live with them. Let's face it. Most of what we do is not breaking news, even though we fantasize we're doing breaking news. Most of what we put on there is features. So I said, now we have time. We're going to make features like movies, you know, drama crying, you know, and a lot of intimacy because it's just you with your phone. So much of their credit also, they said, okay, I like people like that. So um, in one year, we took uh, Spectrum One LA from zero because they were just starting to the number two rated station in Los Angeles, which is a pretty good achievement for one year and very competitive market. And uh, uh, two weeks ago, uh, Spectrum One got 12 Emmy nominations for their first year out. They are pretty good. They were only beaten by KCET, the PBS station, which got 14. And KCBS, the CBS channel that's been in LA for a million years, got two. So um, all in all, Spectrum looked at it and go, that was really good. Yeah. So they said, we'd like to do a deal with you to do all the Spectrum stations across the country, starting in Los Angeles. So then you know, we had to go out to Wisconsin and Missouri and Kentucky and Ohio and do those. 
And then we were supposed to go to Texas in March, but of course the virus came along. So, you know, I thought, oh, that's it, we'll not go to Texas. So instead we said, let's do it on Zoom. Well, as it turned out, Zoom works a whole lot better than in person because unlike your people, we actually get to see them. Your people are all hiding there, so they can really turn on the video. And what we like to say about the Zoom sessions is everybody is in the front row, so there's no hiding like your people. So um, the Zoom session, the Zoom training camps went really, really well. And so then they said, well, you know, let's just keep doing this. So now, unfortunately, we are booked for the next year and a half to do Zoom sessions. Every I bought the apartment next door. I made it into a studio, a Zoom studio. And now we essentially go 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., five days a week, doing nothing but Zoom training sessions, which is kind of crazy. But there you are. I can't fly to England anyway because I'm not getting on a plane. So I'm stuck here. So that pretty much tells my life story, um, if you want to hear it. I don't know why. I do know what you want to talk about because you've got a bunch of things here. Um, I, Gene said to me that you guys, I really wish you guys would turn on the cameras because this is just alienating not to talk to people. Um, what you guys are interested in is you want to become reporters or what's the deal here? Do you want to make money? Because those are two opposite questions. You have to turn on your microphone, otherwise I can't hear you. Yeah, unmute and, uh, and, and uh, speak oh, yeah. up, y'all. Okay. Feel free to join in at Michael's invitation. So I'm actually a PR major who just had a, an interest in um, news production. Yeah. And so this is more about learning how to produce and videography, which is great here today. I was actually really excited about that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of my, I've had a lot of consulting clients over the years. We haven't just done news. We got a lot of corporate clients. We do the United Nations. We've done everybody. And um, video is the lingua franca of Western, say, all culture now. People, the average American spends eight hours a day watching videos, television, or movies, and 19 minutes a day reading, which is depressing, but that's the kind of culture that we have. So if you want to be in PR and you want to communicate with your clients, you must do it in video. There's no question about that. And, yes. not, and, and most PR companies still go out and hire crews and cameramen and directors, which is absolutely, totally insane, because any <laughs> idiot with a phone can make, trust me, broadcast quality video. The trick to communicating ideas with people is storytelling. Storytelling is as old as human experience, right? You go back to Homer, you go back to the Bible, it's all about stories. And what makes a story? A story is a character and an author story. That's how you get an idea across. So you know the Ten Commandments, right? That's very big down there in Georgia, right? The Ten, right. Command Ten Commandments comes from the book of Exodus, right? It's the, now, you know the Moses story, right? Moses, he's in the reed basket, and then they find him, and he goes out to the desert, and there's burning bush. It's great to the 10 plagues and you know this whole great story that goes on. The whole point of the story is to get to the Ten Commandments. If the book of Exodus was nothing but the Ten Commandments, nobody would remember it because who cares, right? One, two, three, I can't remember. Like it's like it's it's like it's like a tweet. But instead they tell this fantastic story about a character, an arc of story. And so to this day, 3,500 years later, you still know the story of Moses, and that's why the Ten Commandments resonates. So when it comes to dealing with your PR clients or anybody else for that matter, you need a character and an arc of story. And that's what we started to do in LA and that's why the ratings took off because people resonate to characters and stories. They don't resonate to information being dragged, drammed down their throat, which is what most news, even network news does. Just a bunch of B-roll, a bunch of narrative. And you can put breaking news on the bottom all you want, which Maggot will charge you about $10 million to tell you that. But it doesn't mean anything because nobody cares and it's also overkill. But give people a character. You ever watch? You ever watch stuff on Netflix? All the time. All the time. And what's your favorite series? Um, right now, it's a series called Blood and Water. Okay, I haven't seen it, but I'm sure it's about a character and stuff happens, right? That's yes. what you watch, right? Yes. You ever, do you ever watch? Um, do you ever watch uh, uh, like The Bachelor or The Bachelorette? Those reality shows. Yes, I have. Okay. So yeah, you're over there. You'd be going, yeah, that's me. I watch that. And why do you watch? You watch to find out who the winner is going to be, right? Right, you're not really interested in the information. You know, when, when you see The Bachelor or The Bachelorette, the series is already in the can, they've already shot it. They know who the winner is gonna be. So it's season one, if they started, welcome to The Bachelorette, here's who won. How long would you watch for? Like two seconds, right? Right, but instead you sit there like an idiot for 13 hours, that's 13 hours <laughs> commercial time, because that's what it's all about, 13 hours to find out who the winner is. You don't really care about the rest, right? Am I right? Anybody ever right. see? Called, anybody ever see a thing called Top Rock Hits of the 80s? You ever watch those countdown shows, those music countdown shows? I love those. Yeah. Oh, you've seen it, right, okay. So when you watch Top Rock Hits of the 80s, what, it's four hours. And why do you watch to find out why? 
who's going to be number one. Who's number one, right? And you say, if they told you at the beginning of the series, here's number one for the 1980s, you would go, you change the channel, right? But you sit there like a moron, nothing personal, through four hours of commercial time, and you don't really care. You don't sit there and go, wait a minute, Inagata Davida is 72, that should be 68. The entire center of the thing is a total abstraction. Do you ever watch a show called um, House Hunters? You ever see that thing? Yes. <laughs> we all love yeah. House Hunters, right? right? We all love House yeah. Hunters. And so you watch and they say, house number one, it's really the, it's the model, right? When they start off, Mary and Joe, Olivia in Colorado, but now they have to move to San Francisco. That's the character, right? And then they set up an arc of story. Which of the three houses will they pick? So house number one, blah, 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 house number two. Now you know, before they shot it, they already bought the house, right? You know it's all fake, but you don't care. And you sit there like an idiot at the end going, it's going to be house number two. No, it's going to be house number three. No, it's going to be number two. It's got the man cave. No, it's number three because uh, that's what you do, right? And then they've got the so deal, good. right? If they reverse the show and they go, Mary and Joe just moved from Colorado, they moved to San Francisco, and they bought this house. Here's two other houses that are like it. How long would you watch the show for? Not Too many. Here's a good lesson for you, okay? House Hunters, since you all know the show, last year, it's produced by a production company called Pie Town. And last year, um, or this year, for this season, HGTV commissioned 450 episodes of that show. Yeah, that's pretty good, right? From Pie Town. You know how much they pay per episode? $250,000 per episode. Whoa. Whoa, right? Whoa. That's pretty good business, right? Yeah. So what are you wasting your time with local news fires? It's idiotic, right? Because with your phone, you can make you can make your own house hunters. Now, house hunters already taken. Go make some other stupid show. It's not that hard. Characters, arc of story, payoff. See how simple it is? Any other questions? Oh, that's it. Okay, so, huh, all right. Lady Mayfield says, what are some common errors you see in storytelling today and how can Merlin does make it? Yeah, the biggest error I see is they suck. Nobody wants to watch them, they're terrible. They give the thing away at the beginning. Local news in particular is absolutely personal, Gene. Absolutely appalling and unwatchable. It's just terrible. So, I, I, storytelling, as I said, it's about character, arc, of story, payoff. It's a very, very simple formula. If you want to understand this, there's a great book called, um, the Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell. That will explain to you. That's um, Star Wars was based on that. Everybody makes great movies. Steven Spielberg read it. Everybody read it. If you want to understand how to make stories, read the book. Or read my new book called Don't Watch This, which is coming out in July. It tells you exactly the same thing. Or my other book, iPhone Millionaire, which tells how to make millions of dollars with your iPhone. See? This is so simple. It's all right there in front of you. Anybody have any other questions before I go back to the written list? Yes. I have a question. This is like completely off topic, but what does it feel like to have your own Wikipedia page? What does it feel like to have your own Wikipedia? You can have your own Wikipedia page. Anybody can. I had my cousin make mine. Are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> but I thought like they instituted some sort of rule where you're not supposed to like edit your own Wikipedia. No, you can't edit your own thing. So go make up a fake thing. You have a dog? Oh, what's your dog? I saw your dog go by. What's your dog's name? Uh, my dog is named Finn. Finn. Oh, Finn. So. Make it, make it, make an email, finn at yahoo.com, and then Finn can post for you all day long. That's so simple. Really smart. Okay, I'm gonna make my own wiki page. <laughs> <laughs> Game the system. Not a problem. That's the only question you got. How to tell you about your own wiki page? Yes. No. Yes. No. Very shy group you have. <laughs> all right, we'll go back to your written questions. Ah, okay. Mallory Harris. Where's Mallory Harris? Oh, Mallory. All right, there we go. Okay. Mallory Harris says, what set of equipment is recommended for a journalist using their smartphone to shoot video? Nothing, absolutely nothing. We have, uh, we have, I mean, we're fielding for Spectrum alone, we're fielding like a thousand MMJs across the country. Phones and nothing else. No, tripods are a total waste of time. You drag them around, they get in your way. You can get a radio mic if you want, but 90% of the time you don't end up using the mic on your life. Forget about lights, they're just annoying. And those stupid gizmos with the, forget it. It's a total waste of time. All, I will show you some pieces if you want. All the pieces that we've done. Oh, are you all on Facebook? Yes. Okay, so you should go check out. There's a, a thing on Facebook that we set up for Spectrum, but you should go get into it. It's called Storytelling Circle. And that's where we post all the pieces, all the Spectrum MMJs are doing. It's a great model for it actually works, and you can go check that out. So all the Spectrum MMJs and everybody else we work with, we, um, we just say, uh, you know, just the phone and nothing else. And it all works pretty well. So I'm a big fan of no other junk. Which news outlets or video journals should we watch? That answers the question. 
When I've, I've built these things all over the world. I've built about 50 or 60 television channels based on the MMJ model worldwide, from the BBC to Spectrum to uh, my, my favorite one was the Eritrean People's Liberation Army hired me to build the uh, Airy TV in Eritrea. We went there just when the Civil War was ending. So that was a kind of a fun uh, operation. But um, people always, clients always say to me, what is the best channel to look at to see where this works the best? And I used to say, I did want to say a, a, a network in Belgium with a newspaper group called Concentra, and they were pretty good. It's where people, the people who buy into it the most are the ones who are the most successful. The ones who look at it as a cheap way of making the same crap they make before, they generally just fall apart. So um, now I say Spectrum One in LA is the absolutely perfect model of how this thing works. And if you're also looking for jobs, which you probably all are, some of you are, uh, Spectrum is one of the few networks that are actually hiring, and they're hiring in huge numbers because they're gonna populate all these stations we're building across the country. The reason we're building the stations is because they make a profit. And the reason they make a profit is, like any business, our cost of manufacture is very low, everything is done on an iPhone, and the ratings are very high, so we can charge advertisers lots of money to be on the channel. It's a very, very simple equation. So if you're looking for jobs, you know, go sign up at Spectrum, then they'll put you through my boot camp. Um, let's see. If you, Ashley Moore, where's Ashley? Yo, Ashley. I'm here. <laughs> Where are you, Ashley? I'm here, my picture is here, I'm sorry. Well, that's okay, all right, we'll just, <laughs> wherever you are. If you could give one piece of advice on how to improve our storytelling skills, what would it be? That's a very good question, Ashley. So, Ashley, um, you probably, when you go home uh, tonight to your, you know, your parents or your friends or your whoever, your boyfriend or whatever you got, and you'll go to them and you'll go, ah, oh, this idiot from New York came on. He was telling us all this stuff about all you need is a phone. The guy's <laughs> cool on, but, you know, Mr. Kirkconnell made us watch it. That's storytelling, right? That's just what you did, right? That's storytelling, okay? And probably you go lots of times, actually, how many times do you ever go to your friends and go, you'll never guess what happened? Right, you, I gotta tell you, that's storytelling. We, we tell stories all the time. We already know how to tell stories. And mostly when I run these boot camps for journalists, the only thing I have to do is unwind all the rules that they were told, which are all terrible. So I tell them, I'm not here to teach you anything. You already know how to do this. The only thing I'm here to do is to unwind all the bad stuff that you think you're supposed to be doing. Like, instead of, so, for example, you know, we always do this example of, you know, we do a little model thing, which I won't run you through, where a little girl comes in with a cat or the dog that's hit, hit by a car and the veterinarian saves it. And then we always tell, how would you tell this to your, you know, your husband or your best friend? You go, you'll never guess what happened. This dog was hit by a car. And then we say, suppose you came home to your parents. Your parents go, how was your day, Ashley? And you sat up in your chair like this and you went, more than 24,000 dogs are hit every year in the greater Georgia area. Fluffy was one of the lucky few. They would think you're out of your mind, right? They would think you're out of your mind, right? <laughs> yes. But we do that on TV all the time, right? We consciously alienate our viewers. If you went to a party and somebody went up to you and go, hello, Ashley, what a pleasure to see you. <laughs> you would run away as fast as you could. You go, that guy is creepy, right? Because that is creepy. But we do it in local news all the time. That's how we present local news, right? We alienate, we say to our viewers, please go away. Please change the channel. Please find something else to watch because we are terrible. We are boring, we are alienating. So the best advice on storytelling is tell the story just like you would tell it to your friends, right? And when we, when we edit, the way we teach people to make stuff is we are picture driven. So we tell them essentially line up the pictures on the timeline first. And if the pictures make sense, then you know what the story is. Then put in the sound bites, right? And we don't interview. We never interview anybody. We don't know any. And then we put in the sound bites. And then we say, now I want you to take the story, whether it's on the phone or the laptop, and I want you to watch it. And while you're watching it, no written scripts. We never have written scripts. We don't write anything. While you're watching it, just talk to me like you would talk to somebody you're sitting on the couch next to them in the living room and tell the story, right? And then it works really well. So one of our basic rules when we build all these stations is no written scripts ever. Writing is antithetical to good television journalism. And of course, once you have a written script, you're locked into the script, which is inherently crazy because you don't know where the story wants to go until you start to lay out the pictures. Get the concept here. Yes, I do. I actually have found it easier when I've done some voiceovers. I catch myself going ahead and recording what I say and then going back to write a script 
because I feel like at times it makes me a little more robotic in my storytelling. If I write it first, I go back and forth. Totally. No, no, don't, we never, we don't do any writing at all. We don't allow people to write scripts because that's not how people talk to each other. But I'll tell you a small anecdotal story of how I discovered this thing. Um, after I left uh, Channel 13 and I got my job at, at Sunday morning, which, of course it was a big deal, it was a network, I was making a lot of money. And I went out to do my first story in Racine, Wisconsin. And it was a story about, um, um, story about Frank Lloyd Wright. He built a, a, the Johnson Wax Building. It's a very famous architectural building. So I went out to, sh I went with the CBS crew from Chicago. We spent like a week there. We interviewed him. We shot a classic, you know, Sunday morning. It was about eight minutes. And then I came back. Oh, and then Charlie Corolt, who you never heard of, but he was a very big journalist. He was the report. He was the correspondent. Oh, you know Charlie, right. Okay, right. Okay. So Charlie flew out for like an hour, which is what he generally did. And we shot him into the story and he walked around and he did some interviews and he went home. And so I came back to New York with my bag of tapes and uh, I sat in my little office and I wrote the script. And then I met with the editor and they had very good editors at CBS. And we cut the story together. And then I left holes in the editor, I left holes where Charlie was supposed to drop in the narration. I sent Charlie the script. And I said to the editor, he's gonna do this. The editor said, yeah. And of course my first story at the network. The editor said, yeah. And so then I thought, I'm going to go over on Sunday morning because the show goes out live and I want to go be in the control room when my very first piece goes out to 30 million people. So I'm in the control room and, you know, Charlie sat on this little stool and they had the stories lined up behind him and I was the number three story. And while I'm sitting in the control room, I suddenly get this wave of nausea, you know, like when you forgot to do something. And I forgot to check whether he'd actually laid in the narration. And I thought that was dumb. I should have checked to make sure. I'm sure it's fine. But I didn't really know. And so I had this like, sickly feeling. So I turned to Ray Ortiz, who was the director, and I said, uh, Charlie put in the narration, right? And I go, no, I don't think he did. And I went, stop, stop, stop. You can't run the piece. You can't run it. it has no narration in it. I'm going to get fired. My very first day, I was going to get fired from CBS. Because what kind of idiot? They're going to run things, got these big holes in it. I go, no, 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 stop the shit. It goes live. You can't do anything. So I was like, I throw up, you know? So they had this big plexiglass window, and you could see the set down below. And I was like, uh, God, maybe I should go to law school. So, um, uh, Charlie's down there and they do the first piece and then my piece is coming up and I, I think this is just the worst thing could possibly happen. And so they start to run the piece and as soon as they start to run the piece, they cut to the piece and Charlie lights up a cigarette because he was a chain smoker. And in front of him, he's got the monitor with my story running by and he's got my script in his hand like this. I see it. And he actually narrates the piece live as the thing goes out in real time. That's how good he was because what made him so great, and he was, it wasn't his writing because he didn't write anything, but what made him so great was people related to him because they felt like he was in the room with them. And he was, because he was watching the piece at exactly the same time, at exactly the same, his head was in exactly the same space as the viewer was. And that's why his pacing was so great. And even if he was off a little bit, he'd go, just look at this. I mean, the guy was a genius. And that's where I learned how to do this. As soon as you have a written script and you sit in a report room going, three, two, one. But things are different in Georgia. You're dead. You're dead because nobody wants to hear that crap. So no written scripts ever. Just be a storyteller. Does that answer your question? Thank you so much, yes. Excellent. Very good. You have another question here. From my research, I hate people who start things like that. Nothing personal. Nobody really does research. From my research, I noticed you bought a small handheld camera to see if you could truly make TV on your own. Yes, I heard that story. You look for authorship and end up creating a new way to produce high quality TV at low cost. That's correct. How'd you come to realize you could produce TV at such a low cost? Because people paid me for it. <laughs> it's pretty easy. This is a business, right? If you're making sweaters and people say, I'll give you $1,000 for the sweater, you go, that's a pretty good sweater. So all I did was run around with my video camera, make little stories, and somebody said, I'll give you $50,000 for that story. I went, take it away. The market will tell you what works and what doesn't work. It's as old as a capitalist. Sarah Gray Bar. Where's Sarah Gray Bar? Oh, there you are. Finally in the corner. Okay, Sarah Gray. Hi. How come you have three names, Sarah Gray Bar? Okay. Um, I have like one of those two-part names. You have two what? My name is Sarah Gray, like a two-part name. Oh, Sarah Gray. Sarah Gray. You're not related to the other bar, are you? Uh, not Roseanne Bar. I'm not. Oh, Roseanne Bar. Okay, fine. Okay. My family's from Iowa. Oh, yeah. My, old, my first girlfriend was from Iowa. She, her father was a teacher at Grinnell. Okay. How did you, you know what, I actually dropped out of college for you and I went to work on a farm in Iowa, in Iowa Falls. Ooh, that's pretty good, right? And I worked in coal mines and on a farm. It was a good experience. You should all drop out for a year and take manual labor. It's a fantastic experience. 
How did you build a video journalism based TV station in New York? Well, we answered that question. What Sorry. was the broadcast industry like before versus the station after it was built? How did you establish a relationship and skills necessary to build a station? Um, I don't know. I had a good idea. I had a working model and they paid me a boatload of money to do it. That's generally how these things work out. So if you have a working model, here's the thing in my own experience is that people, a lot of, a lot of people think you go running after money when you have an idea, but in point of fact, money chases ideas. If you have a good idea, people knock down the door looking to invest in your idea. You need the good idea. That's the problem. What was it like converting the BBC from traditional camera crews to your VJ model? Oh my God, that was like death on the floor. You have no idea how difficult that was. I gave a speech at a thing called, I don't know, News World or something like that in Barcelona. And uh, this guy who was the head of the BBC uh, named Greg Dyke, he was the director general, heard my speech. So he invited me to come to Britain and give a speech to all the BBC. BBC is a huge, I mean, huge network. Give all the managers. So I'm always very unvarnished in the thing. So um, I'll tell you a funny story, actually. So when I, when I went to the BBC as a guest before I spoke, he said, would you like to sit in the newsroom and watch the nightly news go out? And I said, sure. So I watched the news. And of course, they knew I was a guest from the director general. So they're all there. And I had my little suit. I was wearing my little very professional. And so the evening news ran. They ran the story. And then the head, I guess the head of it, because I was there, and was there, and turned around and he goes, how did you like that? And I said, that was the worst unwatchable piece of crap I ever saw in my life. Well, of course, nobody at the BBC says anything like that to anybody. So they were like, whoa. And I go, and they go, do you want to see why? And I go, OK. So I say, Rack back the tape. So the first story was about a closing of a, a steel mill in Sheffield, right? And so I said, run the piece again. So they ran the piece and they had these beautiful shots of the orange stuff and they explode. You see this a million times, the ingots come flying down and the narration was droning on and on and on. Born in 1938, Sheffield. Uh, uh, uh. So when it was over, I held up a 20 pound note and I said, 20 pounds to anybody who can tell me that that story was about. And in point of fact, nobody in the room really got it. It was so, so chock full of information. But nobody could connect to it because there's no characters, no arc of story. And so I said, you see that? And you're all professionals and you've seen it twice. If you don't get it, you think your viewers are getting it? And so they hired me to a five-year contract and a million and a half dollars a year, consulting fee. And so I flipped all, I said, first I said, give me 50 of your people and leave me alone. So I four-walled a hotel in Birmingham and I took them in groups of 25 and I locked them in the hotel for three weeks. They couldn't get out. You don't know this, it was like, yes, it was this mind screwing thing. And I said, nobody leaves. And when they left, they made the most unbelievable stories on their own. I mean, really fantastic stuff. And so Greg Dyke looked and he go, you're hired. So I had a five-year deal, that's where I met my wife, had a five-year deal with the BBC to flip all, I, we put 1,400 people through the boot camps and completely converted the network. But, you know, it's got to work. But also, you have to, in my opinion, you have to be honest with people, right? Generally, when I go to work with local TV stations, I put everybody in a room and then I say, close the door, which is stupid because the door's closed already. It's very dramatic. And I say, let's be honest, just between us, what you put on the air sucks. And they all go like this, like, oh, he knows, he found out, right? But it does suck. I always say, if we took your nightly news show and we burned it to a DVD and we sold it on the corner for a dollar, how many would we sell? And the correct their answer is one. Because you go, ma, please, you got to buy this. You don't understand, right? Nobody wants to pay for what you're putting on the air because it's unwatchable. It's unwatchable. And once you say that to them, they go, well, I guess it is unwatchable. So honesty is really powerful. All right, what's the rest of your question? Is there anything you learned from that that is applicable to what we are doing now? Yes, yes. Don't listen to <laughs> I taught, I used to teach it. I taught at Columbia Journalism School until they threw me out of there. And then I taught at NYU and they threw me out of there. I'm teaching at Oxford now in England. They'll probably throw me out of there one day. But I got thrown out of NYU because, first of all, they were charging the ungodly sum of $86,000 a year to go to journalism school. I mean, that is criminal. So I used to say to my students on the first day, go to the bursar's office, get your money back, withdraw from the school, go get an iPhone and come and see me and I'll teach you how to do this in a week. And of course, the faculty didn't like that at all because that messes with their whole thing. I also used to say, what they're teaching you, anything they're teaching you is completely wrong. Writing for broadcast. Anybody go to journalism school, take writing for broadcast class? Do not listen to one thing those people told you. It is total nonsense. Do not put puns in your news stories. Nobody likes a pun. A pun is the thing your drunken uncle does at Christmas dinner, and you go there and go, hey, it's not funny, Uncle Fred, right? And you do it all the time. 
News spends so much time alienating their viewers, it astonishes me that anybody actually ends up watching it. Because you just keep saying, please change the channel, we're terrible, we're boring, we suck, we don't care about you, please go away. And they're quite successful at that because the ratings are appalling. What do young, blooming journalists need to know to stand out in the 21st century broadcast news industry? I always tell people, you live and die by what you put on the screen. Nobody cares what you went to school, nobody cares who you are, nobody cares what you think. If you can put stuff on the screen that rocks, that people want to see, and how do you know what rocks? It's what appeals to you. If you find it interesting, they'll find it interesting. If you think it's boring, they'll think it's boring. That's how it is. Jayla Johnson, where's Jayla Johnson? Yo, oh, Jayla, there you are, okay. Jayla Johnson, what are some of the major challenges when founding your own media company versus a regular business? No, a media company is a business, right? A media company makes stuff that you sell. It's like making socks that you sell or making anything that you sell. So you gotta make stuff people wanna buy. The great advantage of the media business today is it doesn't cost anything to make the product. When I started, you wanted to make, a, first of all, don't make documentaries. Nobody wants documentaries. People want stuff that's repeatable, right? And people want stuff that people wanna watch. So, you know, and when I started, if you wanted to make a film, you had to get a you know, budget and the director and the producer and the rent the camera crews and the light. Uh, all you need is your phone. So go make stuff on your phone. The great thing is go stick it up. Nobody made a dime on YouTube. YouTube is a total ripoff, but it's a great place to see if people want to watch it. So go stick your stuff up there. If something works, it's like, you know, test kitchens. You know, you want to make cookies. If you don't kill people, that's the first step. People actually want to buy the cookies, then you know they're there. Just make stuff. If people want to buy it, you're in business. If they don't want to buy it, go to law school. If there was one thing you would say to yourself now that you wish you knew before, what would it be? Not to have married my first wife. She's absolutely terrible. Oh, you know what you like? She makes the real housewives of Atlanta. That's her show, right? You ever see that show? Yeah. That's, 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 that's my ex-wife. Yeah, wacky. She was my student. That's the other mistake. Never marry a student. That's a big, big mistake. She was my student. I taught her everything I that she knew. And then she, yeah, I don't want to tell that story. But now she, she produces the real housewives. So at least I taught her storytelling. I got something out of that. So that was the one mistake I wouldn't make again. Alexis McKinney asked, what are the keys to entrepreneurship in the media industry? Where's Alexis? I'm right here. Oh, Hi. Okay. Here's the key to entrepreneurship, not in the media business, any business, make money. Okay? Make money. There's a great curse in journalism because journalists have this, this antipathy towards making money, right? You know, the famous quote is that the purpose of journalism is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That is insane. You want to be comfortable. You want to make money. You want to make millions. Trust me, you do. Money is freedom in America. And did you know that the, telev the television business alone, and by this we mean Netflix and all that other stuff, the television business alone is a $1.73 trillion a year business. That is bigger than the global oil business, which is $1.72 trillion. There are, isn't that amazing? There are literally billions and billions of dollars on the table waiting for you to scoop them off because it's full of idiots. Literally, nothing personal. I know everybody in the business. It's full of morons. And so, like I said about house hunters, if you can make a house hunters, look how much money you can make with that thing. The biggest money I ever made, I mean, selling the channel, that was a pretty good deal. But the most successful I ever was before selling the channel, I produced it. This is a very funny story. To I have time. I'll tell you a very brief story. So, um, when I was first started dating Glenda, my ex wife, you know, like her, when I first started, she was my student. And I, let's face it, I was just hitting off on her, you know, let's be honest. And so she said, I want to be a documentary filmmaker. So I went, okay. So I said, let's go make a documentary film together, right? That would be a good idea, right? So, so we went off to the University of Pennsylvania Hospital in Philadelphia for a weekend, right, to film a documentary film about emergency rooms, right? Because ER was a big show. And so while we're there with the camera, this guy comes in and he says, you, you need a character, right? So this guy came across from me. And I said, what are you doing here? And he said, I was shot six times. I said, you were? He goes, yeah. Now, mostly in movies, people get shot and they die. But in point of fact, a lot of small caliber, the bullet goes in and it's hot and it cauterizes it just there. And he pulled up his shirt and he showed me these like, it's like splinters working their way out. And his girlfriend said, I was shot in the butt. You want to see that? I'm like, no, sorry, don't bother. And so I said, can we put you, we're going to make a TV show. Do you want to be on the TV show? He goes, sure, I'll be on the TV show. And so then the doctor, the ER doctor comes out and says, come on in. So they pull the guy in and the ER doctor, they hate these people. They call them frequent flyers because they get shot, they come in, they go out. So she takes his forceps and she starts pulling the bullets out without an anesthetic. And the guy is going like, ah, 
like that, you know? So I got the camera right in his face, going, ah, like that. And then he pulled the bullet out, and the girlfriend grabs the bullet out of the forceps and goes, you said you were shot with a 38. This ain't 38, this is a Glock 9 millimeter. I got it all on tape, I thought, well, that's pretty good. So we spent the weekend shooting this stuff, and then we came back, and we were gonna cut together a little, like, documentary, right? And so I had all this experience in public television, so I said, Let's get Vietnam footage. You will say the war zones of Vietnam, you know, were brought to the inner city. And she goes, she's much younger than I was. The other thing was students. And she goes, I'm not doing that. I said, what do you want to do? She says, I want to cut it to rock music with lots of flashy moves. And I went, what are you, crazy? And she goes, we had this big fight. So I said, all right, you know what? Go do what you want to do. Mess it up. You'll learn the hard way. It's the arrogance, right? And so she cut together this thing. And it was like, dun, 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 dun. my baby's gonna die. Dun, 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 dun. Don't cut off my leg. Dun, 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 dun. Ah! Right? So I got this meeting with this new channel that was just being launched called the Learning Channel. Right? They just discovered it. I just bought the Learning Channel. It was an educational channel. And when you turned it on, it was like the Romans were a happy people. Right? And it was unwatchable. So we got a meeting and we went down there with our little seven minute demo of this thing that we kept together. This guy, John Ford, who'd just been hired, he'd come from WHYY, which is the PBS station in Philadelphia. That's how I got the meeting. And so we go to this meeting and we go and we bring our little VHS tape. And there's about eight people in this little conference room. The whole learning channel only had like three offices before getting started. And so they said, let's see what you got. So we turn out the lights and we start to do this thing. It's like, do, 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 do. my baby's gonna die. Do, 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 do. Don't cut off my leg. Do, do, do. Ah! And you see all these people are like, because they all come from the learning channel, like this. And then Ford turns to me and says, I want to order 13 shows right away at $200,000 per show. Can you do that? And I went, okay, okay. So $2.6 million slid across the table. That's pretty good. So I went to Glenda, who I was going to marry after that, because I thought, that's a pretty good trick. So I said, well, you certainly know what you're doing. And she turned to me and says, and you don't, so stay out of the edit rooms. <laughs> and that was how I got in the business of reality TV shows. So... That show went for 10 years, 10 years. I don't know how many hundreds of episodes we produced at $250,000 per episode for years. And it spun off. We did paramedics, maternity ward, labor and delivery. We did a series of local TV things called Breaking News that ran for two seasons. It was wild. So there's real money in that. There's real money in the TV business. It's not news for the most part. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Oh yeah, that's the key to entrepreneurship. What is your advice on staying inspired to write find compelling stories. Well, first thing is never write again for the rest of your life. The minute you start writing, you mess the whole thing up. There is no writing. This is a medium that is based on pictures and sound. So you have to deal in the world of pictures and sound. Here's another good thing for you guys. You guys all shoot and cut your own stuff, right? Yep. And you all use what you use, like iMovie or, or a Final Cut. Right. So when you, go to, when you cut mm -hmm. the premiere, so when you go to cut the thing, you start at the beginning and you probably have a written script, right? That's how you start, right? And then you start at the beginning and you go to the end. No, no written script. Sarah Gray, no, she got it, right? She had yeah, we're, uh, we're at a point now where the, I've, I've asked them not yet to write or track anything. Don't it's got to be video, nat sound, and the source sound from the story subject. That's it, but don't write anything anymore. So here's another thing. If you start your edit at the beginning and you work to the end, you'd understand the technology. You're not really using it very well, right? Because that is linear. The people who taught you, taught somebody else, taught somebody else who learned on linear. The whole point of nonlinear is you can start in the middle, you can start at the end, you can go here, you can shove stuff around. You have to be like finger paints with the video. Just mush it around until it feels right to you. That's why I don't like written scripts. Because written scripts lock you into something. So no more written scripts, in my opinion, ever for the rest of your life. Well, that pretty much does all your written questions. That was pretty good. Anybody have any other questions? No. Okay, so I'll show you a little video since I brought it with me. I sent it to Gene. Uh, I said I have two pieces here. One is a news story from Spectrum One, which you'll get an idea of. And the other one is a, um, one of my clients is, um, is a Lonely Planet. You all know Lonely Planet, the travel books? Yeah. So, I, you don't know Lonely Planet, really? Uh, it's so old, man. They do travel books. I guess they're dead also. Anyway, so we're turning them into a TV channel, also using phones and stuff. Hey, let's skip the long part in a minute. But let's look at the, um, we'll look at the, uh, the story. This is by a guy who went through the boot camp uh, named E.K. Hod. And uh, yeah, there it is. So this is all done on an iPhone, right? And uh, all one day turn and all done without a written script or anything else. And oh, the most important thing is the shooting ratio. Um, 
Generally in the television business, we shoot um, a ratio of 20 to one. That's the standard for the industry. So if every minute you put on the air, you shoot 20 minutes of video. Uh, we try to shoot one to one. That is we shoot for the timeline. If you're shooting 20 to one, you're throwing away 95% of your raw material. If you ran a restaurant and you threw away 95% of your food, you'd be out of business. So um, we, we encourage our MMJs to go into any story and spend the first 20 minutes figuring out what the story is gonna be and then storyboard out and then shoot. I need that, I need that, I need that, I need a soundbite from you and I'm done. And that's how they work. So this story, I think he shot three to one ratio, the one day turn. Uh, shot and also edited on the iPhone. Interesting. Let me give it a <clears throat> let me give it a try of uh, get the to get the audio correct. So here it goes. Okay. See if this works. And Is that working? And share. Let's check. Can y'all hear that? No. 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 Oh, me. Sorry, I'm trying to figure this audio out. I apologize, guys. No problem. Let's see. Uh, audio. Same as system. Can you hear me now? Yes, we always heard you. Okay. You know what, Gene? If you release screen control, I think I can do it from here. Gene? Gene, Gene, hello, Gene. No, no. Okay, sorry, I'm back. Gene, if you release screen control to me, I can do it from here. Okay, great. Let me uh, pass it over to you. Okay. And okay, and share screen. Advanced sharing. Okay. Try it now. Okay. Yeah, I got it. All right. Okay. Great. You all see that? Yep. Great. All right. Okay. Here we go. They're hard to avoid, those tents on the side of the road, but have you ever wondered what it takes to survive on the streets? Where would you go for food, shelter, or basic needs? I'm Itai Hot in Hollywood, where I spent 24 hours with a homeless family to try and find some answers to those questions. Here is part two of our story. It's 6 a.m., and after a cold, hard night in tents above the 101, Judy Velez is headed to Tommy's, a neighborhood fast food joint. If you want a burrito, it's four seventy-five, and you add hash browns for another dollar eighty-five. It's good. Steep prices if you have no job and no home. But Judy's not here for the food; she's here for the bathroom. It's one of the only places that will let her use it, and for Judy, it's a godsend. She's my customer, actually. She's homeless, but she's my customer. Judy's family lives on an overpass just a block from Hollywood Boulevard, but they may as well be light years away in a forgotten universe. People walk by them, but few actually see them. The nearly 9,000 homeless families in LA, a number that's grown by 8% last year alone. Judy's family ended up here after her husband Enrique was robbed and stabbed. Now the whole family is in failing health after seven years on the streets. Their son Henry was diagnosed with congestive heart failure after years of using meth. He says he's been sober for six years. Another son, Gus, is homeless on a street nearby. Ming Ming and Bella live here too. Their daughter, Angel, is in a hospital 13 miles away, about to give birth. 
Judy says she dreams of the day they'll get off the streets. If you ever won the lottery, what's the first thing you do? Um, I'd buy myself a home for all my kids and my grandkids um, and donate the rest to the homeless people. But the reality is her daughter is going to need help with that new baby. And at 58, with no fixed address, they're in for a struggle. Like it's, it's, jobs are too hard to come by. Now, you just to work at McDonald's or Jack in the Box, Burger King, you have to be a high school graduate. And a lot of people ain't high school graduate. Even with Social Security and food stamps, they can't afford a studio apartment. The deposits are just too high. In fact, this is one of their biggest assets, Henry's phone, their only form of communication and entertainment. This is how you charge your phone? Yeah. How long does it take you to charge it? Eight hours you pull the charge. It's no secret they've had a rough go. Gangs, drug addiction, and prison have cycled through this family. What they do have is time, and today they'll spend it crossing town to visit Angel and hopefully see their new granddaughter, Marlene. It's a rare moment of unvarnished happiness for Judy. Can't wait to get to the hospital. She knows it's going to be an uphill battle, but there are services for pregnant women living on the streets, and Angel has been placed in a temporary home. It's part of life. There's nothing we, there's nothing, um, we can prevent other than I wish we had a home, you know. Angel is excited too. I want her to hurry up and come out already so, we, so I can hold her and spoil the heck out of her. Having lived on the streets most of her life, she wants to break the cycle with little Marlene. I just want what's best for her not to like to be in the situation that I was in when I, when I was when I, when I was pregnant with her. But what should have been one of their happier days turned out to be one of their worst. Angel had her baby, but was not allowed to keep her. Baby Marlene tested positive for meth, and social services swooped in to protect her. Angel says her addiction got the best of her, and she's determined to make things right. I have so many emotions right now. Um, the main one is like, I feel like I betray, I betray my daughter. But unless Angel can make some massive changes, she may never see that baby again. To do that, she has to get clean and get off the streets. Her boyfriend, Artie, agrees. We gotta prove everybody wrong. Like, we gotta get clean. No one has taken the news harder than Judy. I wanna see her, I wanna hold her. I mean, I just took my son's phone and he has pictures of her. Pictures of the baby are all they have right now. And that's not going to change anytime soon. I just picture sitting in a chair and watching Marlene um, in her swing or in her bassinet. But that dream always disappears every day that Judy wakes up in her cold, hard truth. Okay, here we go. So that is a local news story done by Spectrum One by one MMJ in one day with an iPhone all by themselves. See the difference? You've seen a million stories about homeless. They all suck, right? The reporter does a stand-up. They get man on the street. They do some sound bites and B-roll. They suck. These, you, you could see this as an HBO documentary, right? And that's what we're looking for every single time in all the Spectrum station we're working with that. And everything we've done for years, character, arc of story, intimacy, up close, use the phone, get rid of everything else, and tell it in your own voice. Get the concept here? See how simple this is? Yes, I really felt like I was there. I yes. felt like they they took me there, almost kind of like you're in the person's shoes. Yes, that's exactly right. We want all the films we make, we call them films, we don't call them packages. All the films we make, we want the viewer to feel like they are in the room with the person. That's why we never do reporter stand-ups. To stick a reporter in the middle of a film is absolutely insane, right? It's also why we shoot in sequences, why we follow the character, why we go somewhere. We're making movies here. And people love movies because everybody goes to HBO all the time, right? People go to Netflix all the time. And the weird thing is any local TV station can do this. And the stations that actually buy it, they do very well. But we've done a lot of stations in the United States, Tron in San Francisco, KRN in, in, in Nashville, KGDB in, in San Diego. All they saw was how to make cheap versions of what they do now. 
And what they do now is unwatchable crap, but they keep doing it. They just want to get rid of half the staff and give everybody phones, but they keep turning out unwatchable garbage. So that's how it is. I got an offer from, uh, there's a big group in, big station group in Birmingham. I can't remember their name, Nexstar. Nexstar came down and they offered me this huge contract to flip all their local stations, this model, but they didn't want to do this. They just wanted to fire half the staff and make the same junk they make now, just cheaper. I thought, I'm not doing it. I'm not working with that. And so that's it. You can pick and choose. So anyway, you get the concept here. Any other questions? Yes, I have one, Mr. Yeah. Rosenblum. I also I'd like to say thank you so much for answering my question, though I logged in kind of late. I was having extreme technical difficulties, but thank you so much anyway. Lainey, you're sitting uh, sideways in my thing. It's like you're on the space station. <laughs> okay, ask your question anyway. I'll just turn my head this way. <laughs> so for the local, <laughs> for local news, um, that was a great story. Is there like a time limit you all have, each station has? Because I noticed that was like maybe about a couple of minutes and I know they try to stay within a certain time frame for commercials yeah. and things like that. People always say, how long should the story be? And I always say the story is as long as people want to watch it, right? So this notion of one minute, 20, and you know, this, these, these maggot people, they always say you got to have breaking news every 45 seconds. And it's terrible, it's, it's so destructive. I mean, you tell the story that has to be told and you'll get viewers. If you, if you have a connection with the viewer, you make an emotional connection with the viewer, the viewer will be there. But most of the places you're all probably gonna go work are really terrible and they'll crush you and they'll destroy you and they'll destroy any creativity that you had. And within two years, you'll just be another like cog in a dying machine. So, you know, don't do it. However, Spectrum is hiring a lot of people. Also, my wife said, be sure to tell them, if you wanna sign up for the VJ.com, which is our online film school, go to the VJ, the VJ.com, and Lisa says, put in um, uh, BJ20, it's the discount code, and I think we're giving 20% off. So, but it's also a 10 days free trial, you can try it. Also, if any of you ever wanna send me stories that you've made for unvarnished critiques, and they're pretty nasty, but I'll at least give you my honest opinion, send them to me anytime, I'm always happy to rip you to shreds, because that's the only way to learn. If you knew what you were doing, there'd be no point in having this conversation. Any Thank other you so much. Anytime, any other questions? I kind of have a question. I'm really interested in um, production. Yeah. So just like being in the control room, running audio. And that's what I like part-time did at school. Yeah. And got snatched away thanks to Miss Rona. And how do I mm -hmm. like, get back to that? <laughs> you want to see, you want to be like the control room person? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's interesting because this is a, this is a part of the business that's changing very, very, very rapidly because of COVID and everything else. Most TV stations are now being run off from people's homes, and I don't think they're ever going back. One of the networks I built, did you ever hear Fios for Verizon? You know the, yeah, I built the Fios networks for Verizon, and we did that a 12-year contract with Verizon. And they were a phone company. And when they came to me, I said, just leave me alone. <laughs> because if they were a TV company, we never would have done it. So almost all the Fios stuff was done from people's homes 12 years ago. We hmm. trained the MMJs, we gave them all the same gear. We said, you live in the patch you're reporting from, there's no reason to have a studio. You don't have to go in, all this kind of stuff. We didn't have the control rooms in people's homes, but now you can have the control rooms in people's homes too. And all the MMJs cut their own stuff and uploaded it. And we had an LA editor in LA and LA, they put the show together, put the commercials in. So the average cost of a half hour of, Gene will be shocked by this. The average cost of a half hour of television news at Fios was $1,400 per half hour, which made our commercial break even spots $4 per spot. Everything over $4 was profit. That's pretty good, right? That's pretty good. But Gene, I don't know who owns your group, but if I went to them and said, close down the studio, everybody work from home, they would throw me out there. They think I had on my mind a million reasons why you can't do it. But you can do it. So Kelsey, if you want to get on the cutting edge of this thing, learn to do it at home. Have you got like an iMac or something at home? Uh, yeah. yeah. Get the software, right? And learn how to do it yourself. And then walk into any station group and go, I know how to do this. And I can do it from my house, right? So that's where There's, the industry is. A lot of cutting edge stuff going on right now, uh, mm -hmm. Kelsey, with uh, streaming, live streaming. You know, that's why I encourage you all to start a Twitch channel and see what's going on there because that's a, a lot of blue ocean there. And what a lot of those live streamers use for their production control is a software program called OBS, Open Broadcaster Software, and it's free. And if you can load that on your Mac or load it on your PC and you can switch an entire show that looks 
every bit as good as what comes out of a control room. It's really good looking. Yeah, so I would yeah. encourage you to master that. And then you not only have the skills that you need to do production and, and, and uh, uh, things like that, but you have the entire studio in your laptop. So you can do it from anywhere. Five years ago, Thank you so much. I cast it for 50,000 bucks to do what free software does now. So if you, can, if you can master that stuff, like Gene says, you get a job, and it's not just networks. Everybody is doing this thing. Every web page, every social network group, everybody's getting in this business. So there's mm -hmm. lots of opportunities. Oh, amazing. Any other questions? So I have one final question before you before we wrap it up, if you don't mind. We've heard some awesome stories about how the idea wins out, how content wins out, how a great story wins out. But I think a lot of young people, and even myself, who's been – in the traditional model for a long time, we don't really know that world where that meeting you talked about, getting the meeting at the learning channel, or how do you get that idea in front of the people who will buy that idea? So here's the deal with most of these people is that um, they, um, they are always looking, they're in trouble. All these people in the broadcast business, they're in trouble. They're frightened, they're nervous, they got mortgages, they got kids, they could be fired tomorrow if they don't get their ratings. There's looking for somebody to solve their problem. And so what I've done for my entire life since I was like in my 20s is um, I always read the trades and I always read the Wall Street Journal and I always look for interesting people to write to or do interesting things. And then I write letters. I don't do email because email is easy to delete. I actually write letters and sometimes I actually type them on a typewriter, which makes them think their kid's been kidnapped. So they actually have to make And I try to write 100 letters a month. Now, this seems like a lot. It's only three a day. It's not that demanding, right? So anybody I find interesting, I write them. And they're very short letters. I tell you a quick story about time for a quick story. I, I, and I, I, I provide them with an answer. I don't write an application job. I say, what you do is terrible. I can fix it. So many, many years ago, I wrote to Ted Turner, who you probably never heard of, but he launched CNN. And so I didn't know Ted Turner at all, but I wrote Ted Turner this very brief note. And I said, dear Mr. Turner, you make television all wrong. Right? You do it completely much too expensive way. I can show you how to do it. And then the next paragraph was, I can give you the world or any part of it. You, you give me 10 minutes, I'll give you the world or any part of it you don't already own, very truly. And I mailed the letter. Three days later, my phone rings. It's Ted Turner on the phone. I didn't know him. He didn't know me. He says, you want your 10 minutes? You got it. You'll be in my office tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. And hung up the phone. So I went to his office the next morning at 9 o'clock. And he's there with his watch. And he goes, go. Just like that. So I said, you make television all wrong. Blah, blah, blah. You should, he said, get rid of your cruise. Just need one person. And kind of stuff. He goes, you're right. I know. You're right. I know. You're right. I know. He goes, stop. And he turns to the assistant and says, get me Pat Mitchell on the phone. Pat Mitchell is running CNN in Atlanta. So he's on the speakerphone. She goes, yes. He goes, I got this Michael Rosenblum in here. He's going to come down at Atlanta. He's going to show you that. And he hangs up the phone. He goes, you get to get on plane. You go see Pat. And then he was a big guy and he smacks me like this. He goes, you a smart Jew. You're going to save me a lot of money. Bang, like that. So I went, okay. <laughs> I went on the page and I went to see Pat Mitchell. And so she was, you could see that she was so annoyed and she had like lightning bolts coming out of her eyes. And she goes, how did you get him? I go, I wrote him a letter like I do with everybody. So my general rule is I write 100 letters a month. I get 10 answers. Of the 10 answers, I generally get one deal. Maybe, maybe not. So generally, I run a 99% failure rate. For most people, this would be devastating. I couldn't care less. You're, when you're in, the, you're in the media business, it's like you're going to Las Vegas and you put your one chip down on 26 all the time on roulette. And you go, I don't understand. I never win. Put down 100 chips. Trust me, you'll win somewhere. You got to get in churn all the time, all the time. Also, have a website, blog every day. It doesn't matter what kind of crap you write, whatever pops into your head. It's how you get, you know, you go through it. And because when people get a letter from you, the first thing they do is you Google you, right? And if you have populated the media world, put videos on YouTube. I try to put a video on YouTube every day. I write a blog every day for the last 20 years. Sometimes it's interesting, sometimes it's crap. But when people look at it, they go, whoa, this guy must, I don't know anything. It's, oh, and here's the last piece of advice. When you do get a meeting and people say to you, and they will, how much do you charge for this? I mean, I probably now inflation will destroy this. I used to say, a million dollars. That's what I want as an upfront fee. And so they either did two things. They either go get out because you're an idiot or they go, this guy must be very good. Look how much he charges. And they would sign me up, which was crazy in some ways because I'm not telling you anything you can't find out for free. 
So trust me, that's the secret to success in my experience. That's great. Well, well there we are. We're, we're over our hour, but thank you so much, Michael, for being with us. Tons of great takeaway, tons of gold here today. And uh, uh, I have sent you a couple of uh, other students that I couldn't fit into the, the internship and that's to your site. I hope they signed up for you. Great. Um, and uh, so thank you so much and we appreciate your time. Best of luck in your endeavors and everybody. Thank you, Jim. Have a wonderful thank week. You. This has been wonderful. <laughs> Don't hesitate to get in touch. I'm always here. I got nothing else to do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Stay safe and be blessed. Bye, y'all. Bye. 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 Bye.